For decades, surfers have made the pilgrimage to Hawaii, paying homage to its golden beaches and bowing before its world-class waves. Lately, though, these waves are attracting new disciples. Both a surfer and an OPT engineer are looking for waves with a lot of energy to them. Charles Dunleavy is CEO of Ocean Power Technologies. He and his engineers are looking to revolutionize the renewable energy industry. It's one of the great advantages of wave energy is that it's close to the shore and as you look around the world, the majority of the world's population is very close to shore. On the shores of Kaneo Bay, Hawaii, Dunleavy's company has found a powerful ally in the U.S. military. A lot of Navy and Marine Corps bases are located uh, on the water, and uh, ocean energy is there all the time. Left, right, left, Colonel right. Robert Rice is commanding officer of the Marine Corps Base Hawaii. At first glance, the Colonel and Dunleavy may appear to have little more in common than the color of their life preservers. But both are energized by what lies ahead of them, out in the open ocean. Once connected to the energy grid this spring, this massive buoy will send 40 kilowatts of electricity back to shore. It's enough energy to provide power for two dozen homes. While located near a marine base, the US Navy is actually providing the bulk of the project's funding. We're trying to evaluate this technology for Navy applications and uh, the best way to do that is to be actively involved with the project. So we're, we're trying to support this contractor, help him make the right decisions, make good technical decisions so that his product will eventually be available for us and others as well. It is a, a fabulous site for us from the standpoint of the reception and support of Marine Corps Base Hawaii as well as the U.S. Navy. But for all the support OPT has received along Hawaii's picturesque shoreline, the true test may lie 4,000 kilometers away. In the harsh winter environs of the Oregon coast. You know, these are waves that could reach heights as high as 40 to 50 feet. Oregon has one of the best wave climates for wave energy conversion anywhere in the world. And that's why we're here. Here, is Oregon Ironworks. And Phil Pellegrino is getting a tour as workers fabricate the next generation of OPT boys. 35 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. The PB-150 will be larger and more powerful than its counterpart in Hawaii. Once in the water, the boy will generate up to 150 kilowatts of power. It works by using a float that rises and falls with each passing wave. That forces a drive rod up and down, which causes its power takeoff system to turn a generator inside the buoy. The electricity produced is then sent to shore through a subsea cable. To be cost effective, several buoys need to be clustered together at a site along the coast. We would like to see the Oregon coast develop hundreds of megawatts of wave farms. It has the potential to do exactly that. On the docks along Oregon coast, not everyone shares Pellegrino's enthusiasm. Nick Furman heads Oregon's Dungeness Crab Commission. At roughly $80 million, it's the state's most valuable fishing industry. Furman also represents a collective of fishermen. He's working with elected leaders and the wave energy developers to come up with a way for both industries to coexist. We've kind of accepted the fact that even though it is prime habitat for Dungeness crab, even though it is an important and significant area, um, we're going to have to put those 10 buoys in the water. Our biggest fear is that if it were to be successful, instead of seeing fishing boats um, operating you know, up and down the coast, all we saw was buoys um, bobbing up and down. And I think that's going to be the challenge. The local communities are going to have a lot of power to stop these projects. Dr. Robert Pash runs the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center. Wave energy right now, we're 
we are estimating is around 50 cents a kilowatt hour. But what we expect to see is a curve much like we saw in wind. 30 years ago, wind energy cost about 50 cents a kilowatt hour. And it's now down in the seven to five cents a kilowatt hour range to where it's competitive with a lot of carbon-based sources. At Oregon State University's Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory, another wave energy company, Columbia Power Technologies, is testing a 1 15th scale model of their wave boy. Ken Reinfrank believes CPT's design will be a game changer. It'll look awesome. It'll be 60 feet in diameter, 75 feet tall, and weigh over 1,000 tons. The profile at the surface is uh, very low, and you actually won't see it a mile offshore. For Dr. Pash, helping developers make advancements in wave energy is a chance to atone for a mistake he believes the United States made when it turned away from wind energy. The U.S. led the world in wind energy in the 1970s, and then for political reasons, the federal government sort of withdrew support from that industry. In Europe, there were some countries that didn't let up. And I, th I think the Danish are a good example of that. You know, the, the Danish companies have a huge part of the market share in terms of wind energy machines across the world. Even the most optimistic experts agree, wave energy will probably account for about 15% of the world's renewable energy portfolio. Still, OPT's Dunleavy insists that will make it a multi-billion dollar industry. We believe that in the next two to three years we can attain production volumes that will help us to compete with other forms of renewable energy, uh, but also begin on the curve of being able to become competitive with fossil fuel based energy. While the world searches for alternatives to fossil fuels, Wind and solar may appear more viable, but there are many who believe the next wave will be just that. After the break, Denmark has been at the forefront of wind power since the 70s. So what can the rest of the world learn from the Danes' love affair with the wind?